Yeah, so I'm Marcus. I uh, just defended my PhD and um, uh, work in, in the lab of Eric Lekholm, where we study uh, cancer genomics. Uh, and so this talk is going to be about, as the title suggests, computational studies of mutational sequence signatures in cancer genomes. So mutational signatures uh, is the main focus. So what are those? Well, mutational signatures are uh, or can be thought of as a typical pattern that is um, imprinted by a mutational process on genomes that they affect. So for example, um, if you have cells that are exposed to, to UV, for example, you will see a certain pattern in the genomes that those affect. Uh, whereas if you have cells that are exposed to tobacco smoke, you will see a different kind of pattern. So we can use these patterns to study the mutational processes in different cancers in, and in cells. Uh, and that, that is what, what my focus has been mostly during my PhD. Um, so I will just continue here. Um, this, oh, sorry. Uh, there we go. Um, so this will be about uh, results from three papers, basically. Um, and it's only the first two ones that really goes into depth uh, with regard to mutational signatures. And in the third paper, signatures is only a very minor part, but we will highlight other very interesting features in a, in a very special cancer. Um, so a good place to start, I think, is to just put mutational signatures into perspective in, into, in cancer in general. So what we know from, uh, from a long time now is that uh, in healthy cells, um, you have cell division being tightly regulated. Cells are not supposed to divide unless they really told to do so. Uh, but some cells might acquire certain attributes and uh, which might free them from these limitations. Basically, they, they might start to to divide more rapidly than, than their neighbors. And when they do so, they are under positive selection. So typically that happens via mutation. So here you have different cells that have other phenotypes than their neighbors. And in some cases, this results in, in positive selection and, and clonal expansion. And this process can then uh, start again. So you can have a new phenotype arising in one tumor clone here, uh, resulting in subclonal um, expansion as well. Um, and this, these traits are typically generated, as I said, through mutations. I say typically because in the last paper we'll see a uh, cancer type where this probably is not the case. Uh, but typically mutations are what generates uh, these new phenotypes. So therefore understanding mutation is very important for, for cancer genomics research. Uh, and there's two classes of, of uh, of genes that can be affected via uh, mutation that results in, in this uh, positive selection. We have oncogenes, and these are genes that are uh, have rather normal functions in terms of cell growth and proliferation that might not be very active in normal cells, but, but can be upregulated in, in tumors. And then there's tumor suppressive genes as well, and those have the opposite effect, basically. They, they are meant to, to put brakes on cell division and can even induce apoptosis if you have um, aberrant behavior in, in certain cells. And when mutations such as these are collectively known as driver mutations. Uh, so in a given cancer, we have typically loads of mutations, especially if, if it's a cancer type that is exposed to a very um, potent mutagen, like UV, for example, we might have hundreds of thousands of mutations, but only a handful of those will actually have um, a positive or, or an effect of, on, on selection and be um, driving the cancer. And the vast majority then are passenger mutations that doesn't have any effect on, on um, tumor development. So it's rather important to be able to, to differentiate between driver mutations and passenger mutations um, in cancer genomics. So how would we go about to do that? Well, typically we uh, use a measurement of recurrence. We look for certain genes or positions in the genome that mutates more often that, than you would expect by random chance. So if you have a large collection of, of uh, patients, you can see if there's certain mutations that reappear over and over. Uh, 
because if that happens, that's typically a sign that positive selection is acting on those on those specific mutations. So here you see this is a, a collection of colorectal patients. APC and TP53 are very clear cut driver mutations here. They occur in around 60% of the patients in, the, in this cohort. Uh, and then there's a lot of genes that are less frequently mutated. And, and the tail goes on here until you have only a couple of percent of the patients actually have the mutations. And eventually it becomes rather hard to, to know if uh, are these actually selected for these, uh, these mutations in, in these genes, or are they simply um, mutating at a higher probability by random chance and, and there's no real selection? And we really need to know what we expect from, from random chance. How, how often do we expect mutations to happen even when selection is absent? And that can be quite tricky because mutations doesn't appear in the genome uniformly. So if we look at a very broad scale here, we see that mutations varies quite a lot on a megabase scale here. So in red, you see mutation frequencies uh, across chromosome 14 here. And uh, so we see that there are some peaks here where mutations appear rather often and valleys where it's rather rare. And we also see that these co-vary with other features such as gene expression and uh, replication time. So if you find genes that are mutated in these regions here, then that's not super surprising because it, or relatively speaking, not super surprising because it's an inner region that often mutates. Whereas if you're looking at genes in this valley here, that then if you see recurrence in cohort, then that's more surprising because, because this is not a region that is typically mutated. So maybe that's positive selection instead. Um, so this is on a megabase scale, but if you hone in on single nucleotides, then for different mutational processes, you have vastly different probabilities of mutations as well. And this is where mutational signatures comes, uh, comes into light. So uh, this is what one mutational signature might look like. This is for tobacco smoke. And these mutational signatures describe the six possible uh, substitution types, as you see here. You might think that, what about the other substitutions like G2A, for example, but uh, G2A is the same as a CTT mutation on the opposite strand. And here we only consider the pyrimidine-based uh, nucleotide as a reference, C or T. So in this case, for tobacco smoke, you see that it's mostly C2A mutations that happens. Whereas in UV light, you see that it's almost exclusively C2T mutations. And not only do we see what kind of mutation that is most frequent, we also see in what trinucleotide context do they appear? So uh, if the flanking nucleotides here are T and T for the cytosine here, then that's more likely than TCG, for example, here. Uh, and this is also very useful because you can have different uh, mutational processes that both generate a certain mutation, but they happen at different trinucleotide contexts. Um, so uh, for many years now a lot of mutational signatures have been identified this was i think 2013 we knew about 30 mutational signatures many of these are uh, not known what what the underlying mutational process is but some of them are and now there's even more mutational signatures that have been identified over 50 now i think um but to show some examples here, here we have and uh, signature one, which is cytosine deamination. Um, and as you can see, this is also C to T dominant mutational signature. But because we have the trinucleotide context as well, we can clearly see that it's different from the UV, which you saw before, that it has a completely different trinucleotide profile. Um, and uh, aging, this is just a, a process that happens in every cell. You accumulate mutations randomly. And this is very uniform, you see more or less every kind of mutation and in most trinucleotide contexts as well. And both of these are processes that you expect to see to some extent in basically every cancer type because it's, it's a baseline mutation um, process, so to speak. Uh, so we call these clock-like mutational signatures because they, they accumulate uh, slowly over time in, in every cell, basically. And then there's other mutational processes. This is 
from a protein known as APOBEC, and that can induce uh, mutations at single-stranded uh, DNA and RNA. And it's very specific in what kind of transnutritide context it is, and generates mostly C2G or C2T mutations. And many of the others are, as I said, uh, unknown. Some are uh, related to uh, repair, DNA repair, for example. Uh, but the one that we are most interested in, especially for, for my first paper here, is uh, the signature 7, or the mutational signature of UV. Uh, and as we saw, it, it generates almost exclusively C2T mutations. And we can also see that the, the trinucleotide contexts that are affected are in dipyrimidine context, so either CC or TC, where the last nucleotide is not as important. Uh, and it's not a surprise why, uh, why we see this pattern, because we know that UV generates uh, CPDs, or cyclopentane pyrimidine dimers. This is a, a natural uh, confirmation between between the pyrimidines after it has been um, subjected to UV light. Uh, and if the second C, uh, the second nucleotide is a cytosine in this CPD formation that would form between the pyrimidines, then this deaminates very fast and, and the C would then um, become a T after replication and so on. So it, it's kind, kind of well understood why, why we see this pattern for UV. Um, but when we have uh, a melanoma cord, for example, it turns out that the trinucleotide signature is, in fact, not uh, enough in, uh, in order to model the mutations that we typically see. Uh, on a broad, broad sense across the entire genome, it is. But when we look at the most recurrent mutations, so this would, in most other cases, uh, be driver mutations. Uh, but in melanoma, when we look at, at the most recurrent mutations, we find a lot of passenger mutations, uh, not driver mutations. So the, the only drivers here are the third mutations that you see here. Um, I should say that these are mutations in promoters that we look at and see the level of recurrence here. How, how many patients do we find this mutation in? But the vast majority here, almost all of them, are passenger mutations and they occur close to or overlapping the sequence pattern TTCCG. And we know from studying this effect uh, quite extensively in, in our lab that TTCCG is a UV hotspot. It's a, uh, it generates um, mutations very, very easily close to this um, uh, sequence pattern. And here I cut off the list, uh, the list goes actually on. So there's many positions where, where you see high recurrence of mutations in TTCCG um, sites. And we also know why this is the case now through, through studies in, in our lab and also other labs, uh, that these TTCCGs are a binding motif for ETS transcription factors. So when these motifs bind, you have a, an elevated uh, CPD uh, formation rate at these sites and also somewhat at, at the middle positions here as well as uh, somewhat reduced uh, DNA repair. So all in all, you have a vast increase in mutations at these sites because you have a protein that binds and when that, that is bound, you have um, uh, a lot more frequent CPD formations at those sites. So obviously the, the trinucleotide signature cannot really capture this effect. We, we cannot model how often we find mutations here because the trinucleotide is not what define uh, the recurrence at all. And that leads us into to my first study, which uh, is about the, the uh, mutational signature of UV light. Um, and so the effect we saw with TTCCG is unique to actively uh, transcribed uh, promoters, and it's a longer pattern. So we want to, wanted to study this uh, in detail, see how, how does the mutational signature of UV vary in different uh, genomic regions. Um, can we say something about the differences that we see if we find any? And also, is, can we model this um, uh, mutational frequency uh, increases that we see in TTCCG related um, uh, positions? So to start off, we looked at different genomic regions. So we divided the gen genome into 15 different regions based on histone marks. And what you can see here is 
that uh, marked in red here are the regions that are related to promoters. Uh, you can see that, that they uh, these are close to transcription start sites, TSS. And what the bars shows is the similarity to the canonical UV signature. So, so the trinucleotide signature I showed before, if it's close to one, it means that, that they are very similar to, to the, that signature. But promoters are um, differ in, uh, in, in that respect. They, they are not as similar to, to the canonical signature. And we can also see a kind of a gradient that uh, it is in the highly ex uh, expressed promoters that we see the biggest difference. And it's at the TCG and TCC peaks, the, the most commonly mutated trinucleotide that we see kind of shift. So this uh, in yellow here, non-promoters, this is what you see in the genome at large. But when you go up to highly expressed promoters, you see that TCG um, mutation frequencies are, are reduced and instead TCC becomes the most frequent one. And the lowly expressed promoters are somewhere in between. So we wondered, of course, what is the reason for this? And there's another pattern here that might not be evident. And that, that is that CG or CPGs are um, uh, typically uh, methylated throughout the genome. So a cytosine in the genome will typically have a uh, methyl group uh, at the cytosine. Uh, but in promoters, uh, cytosine methylation serves uh, um, epigenetic purpose. Basically, if you have methylated cytosines, you silence the gene that the promoter uh, is before. So in highly expressed promoters, you would expect uh, methylation to be absent, basically. So we checked this as well. Um, and so first of all, we see that in the promoters, you see less methylation in C at CPG sites. And we see that the relative weight of TCG in the signature increases with methylation. So, so this um, is possibly just an effect of methylation, basically. If we look at promoters specifically and, and divide them based on, on the methylation status, we also see a very clear pattern that when you increase methylation, you see an increased relative weight of augmentations in TCG sites. Um, so why do we see uh, more mutations in TCG sites depending on methylation. Uh, and that was studied um, uh, by uh, a protocol called uh, CPD-SEC. This is work done by Karen Elliott and uh, who did the experimental part of, of, uh, of this paper. Uh, and what this does is basically uh, a sequencing protocol that allows us to study the CPD formation, not, not the mutation, but the actual damage, the, what you see here, the nick between two, two pyrimidines after uh, UV light. Uh, and then we see where, where do we find CPDs and, and do CPDs also differ with methylation? Uh, and in fact, it does. So, if, uh, so in blue here, you see um, uh, UVB irradiated cells and in red are UVC. So UVC, the reason we have this is uh, because we have used UVC a lot before in, in our uh, lab. It's uh, apparently easier to work with in the lab. But UVB is what, what is more, um, uh, it, it is what penetrates the atmosphere, so it affects us uh, down on Earth. And it's the, the only UV length that, that uh, have this effect with, with uh, methylation. So in, in both in the genome at large and in promoters exclusively, we see this pattern that uh, CPDs form at a greater extent when you have greater methylation, uh, leading to a greater number of mutations as well then. Um, and finally, we wanted to address this issue with uh, longer patterns uh, that have a, a strong effect on mutation probability, especially in promoters in melanoma. So we formulated a new type of mutational signatures, one that takes the trinucleotide uh, component. We, we only care about CTT mutations in, in this study because that's basically all of the mutations in, in UV, um, UV cancers, such as melanoma. So, so in this model, we, we take the trinucleotide component and then we add contextual motifs, uh, which we model as 
increasing or decreasing mutation probability. So they, they get kind of a modulating um, effect on, on mutation probability. And we simply see, are the, is this pattern present, present or not within 10 bases upstream or downstream the affected nucleotide? And we do this on, uh, on all the different genomic regions to, to explore longer patterns in, uh, in UV light. And what we find is, well, as expected, TTCCG. This is absolutely the strongest effect we find, and we find it only in promoters that are highly expressed. This E1 region are, are the highly expressed promoters. Uh, so we see a drastic increase of mutation rates when we, when we have TTCCG um, uh, within the flanking uh, region. And we also find some other patterns like TTTCG and TTCGT and a very similar pattern here and some other patterns also. Um, and some of these have at least been mentioned before in the literature uh, in, in other studies as well. Um, and then we apply this model to the recurrent promoter mutations that I showed you a list of before. Um, so these, here we see the expected mutation probability by random chance uh, when you don't have selection present. So we, here we know that only the third mutations are really uh, driving mutations here, and, and then you have a lot of, of um, passenger mutations. And this is what, what the trinucleotide model uh, says, the expected mutation probability. But if we use the longer context as well, then we shift all the passenger mutations to have an, a higher mutation probability. See also that they, it's a log scale here on the x-axis. Uh, so all, all the passenger mutations get a higher mutation probability simply because we know about the, the TTCCG effect here. Uh, so this suggests that we uh, can model mutation, um, mutational signatures through trinucleotides, but also with longer, uh, longer context. And in some cases that might be important, such as the recurrent mutations in melanoma promoters. Uh, so to summarize this study, we showed that, that the signature of UV light is actually not static. It varies depending on what regions you're in, and especially promoters compared to, to the rest of the genome. And we see that the differences we see is um, mostly due to CPD formation, and that CPD formation forms uh, differently depending on if cytosines are methylated or not. Um, and we can formulate a new type of mutation model or mutational signature models and that, that includes both trinucleotides and a longer sequence context. Um, so uh, since uh, at least a couple of years back, there has been some emergence of, of other reports of, of the longer patterns, not, nothing as drastic as TTCCG, uh, in melanoma, but, but at least uh, longer context has start at least appear in, in studies. But there's not really uh, any packages or tools for doing that type of analysis in general. So that, that is what, what my next uh, paper is about. Uh, so here we create a, a new toolkit, uh, an R package that can be used for, for uh, finding these type of patterns and doing this kind of analysis that I just showed you. Um, and uh, then we apply this to, to a number of different uh, cancers in, in an open cancer database, basically. Um, so something about the, the pipeline when I'm using this uh, tool. And some, some of this is basically identical to, to before, at least the first two steps. So, in order to uh, have some kind of idea of how frequent do we find longer patterns at all and, and trinucleotides and how do they co-occur and so on and so forth, we do sampling of, of positions. So we have both mutated sites and non-mutated sites uh, that we sample from the genome. And so we have a data set that, that becomes, basically it's a classification problem then, is, is a certain site mutated and what kind of mutation is it? mutation is it. Um, but when we do an um, um, extended model like this, it's very important to know 
what are the patterns that we are going to look for at all. Um, so if we have a size five here, pentamers that we look for, then, then there's more than a thousand possible patterns to look for. And if you go to uh, k-mere size of six, for example, then it's a factor of four, so 4,000. And obviously most of these patterns will not have any impact on mutation probability. So we have to uh, do something to, to uh, select the candidate set of, of uh, patterns to look for. And in the first run, we we'll simply do a very simple test to see if there's some kind of correlation between uh, a certain pattern being present and mutation uh, being present. And from this, we can cut off most of the, most of the patterns. Uh, but you still have a lot of uh, uh, false, not false positives, but a lot, a lot of patterns that aren't really inform informative. So in a second step, we also take what, what we find from here, uh, and we uh, estimate the importance from each pattern. And th this can be done through uh, a random forest fit. So after you fit a random forest, you can ask the model basically, hey, which features did you find useful for classifying here? In this case, we classify its position as non-mutated or mutated T to G or T to A or C to T and so, so on and so forth. Which patterns uh, was useful in this model at all? And then you can see this in a plot and you can select the ones that seem to be most informative uh, to follow up on that. Uh, and then after selecting uh, certain patterns, can estimate the effect of those together with the trinucleotide. And we see in red here that certain patterns would increase mutation probability and other patterns would reduce mutation probability. And we also take some steps to, to avoid overfitting in this case. So the first step after creating the, the package was to test it on uh, sim, oh, sorry, I should also mention that there's a step where we can see uh, what position is the most affected uh, for, for a given pattern. So the first thing we did was to simulate data to test the package. Uh, and here we just simulate 100,000 mutations in a collection of 1 million positions totally. Uh, and we just randomly induced the, the mutations in, the, in one set. And then for the positive set, we copied the, uh, or made a completely identical data set, but where some, some uh, patterns had increased number of mutations. So adding 50 mutations that are close to a certain pattern. And we just wanted to see, can we, after in, in, um, inducing these mutations, so to speak, can we find them at all? And we can through this uh, important scoring. And when we select some of these patterns to fit the mutation model, um, do we find reasonable coefficients? And we do. And all the other patterns are reduced to zero, uh, meaning that we, we don't really overfit and we find what we expect to find. Uh, so following this, we apply this on 23 different cast types to see are there any patterns that are usually high, more highly mutated than, than what you would expect uh, based on a trinucleotide signature. Oh, sorry. Uh, and what we find are uh, quite a lot of different patterns. I won't go through this, but uh, I can just mention that, that most of the patterns are rather simple patterns. You have mono repeats, for example, that seem to be very frequent. Uh, the axis here shows uh, how, how often you find this pattern having a non-zero effect. Um, so then we want to see, are there any general patterns that we find? And we do find some patterns that seem to affect basically every cancer. Uh, and if we start with this TTTCG, which I mentioned earlier, this was something we found in, in melanoma. Uh, we see that this effect seemed to be present in almost every cancer type here. There's just a few that doesn't have um, this effect. And when we look at the position, the position specific effects, we see that it's actually the, the middle C here, where you're seeing increased mutation rates. Um, so this was a bit surprising that it's so common. Um, it, it probably isn't then something uh, very specific to UV, but what, what we know 
is that UV, as I mentioned before, is also dependent on methylation. And we know that cytosine methylation happens in, in every cancer. So, so one can speculate that somehow this maybe has something to do with methylation because it's in a CPG context. Uh, and that, that would explain at least uh, why we can see it in every cancer. And it would also explain to some extent why we see it in melanoma, even if it's not spontaneous deamination, since methylation would also affect CPD formation. Um, and then we find some other patterns that also seem to have the same type of effect uh, across most cancer types. And I will highlight a few of these. Um, so uh, here we see uh, cancer, cancers ordered by how, uh, how much of different signatures we find in them. So signature 2 and 13 are both apobex signatures. And we, if we arrange the cancer based on, on apobex signature weights, we see that there are certain, um, certain patterns that also um, seem to favor apobex heavy cancers. And at least two of these have been uh, uh, described before. So APBEC is known to have some, some sequence preference to, to these longer sequences, especially TCAA has been uh, well described before. Uh, and that APBEC have some uh, sequence specificity that is beyond the trinucleotide. So, um, so it's perhaps not a lot of news here, but it, it at least proves that, that the tool works. Um, and that we see C to G and C to T mutations being affected also um, gives support that this is actually effects of APOBEC because those are the mutation types that APOBEC typically generates. And we also find some uh, more vague correlations, you can say, to other processes like uh, mismatch repair or full E mutated samples. So here we have different tints of purple, which are uh, MMR related uh, signatures and also Paul E in green, and another signature, signature 17, uh, which isn't related to, to these patterns, but, but these seem to have some kind of, of uh, correlation with, with these very simple patterns like monorepeats of A or, or monorepeats of T. And this is, at least for MMR and Paul E, also um, uh, described before, so uh, not really news in that sense. Um, and we can also check the uh, position specificity for, for these patterns. We see that this uh, C here and C here are what's uh, affected in, in APEX. So you see an increased number of C2G mutations than you would expect based on a trinucleotide model. In MMR, you see uh, mutations in one of the two first thymines, uh, either T2A or T2G. And this uh, signature 17, which is an unknown signature actually, um, and is very specific to uh, the esophagus and stomach. There we see an increased uh, uh, prevalence of T to G mutations at the first T. And this was the only thing that I thought was new until very recently when, when I saw a paper that actually explained this uh, or demonstrate this in signature 17 as well. Uh, but at least the tool works then. Um, so in short, uh, this is a toolkit that basically builds on what we learned from the first paper uh, and takes some extra steps to, to explore KMERS and also uh, avoid overfitting. Um, and when we apply this to cancers, we find a lot of, of patterns, actually. Most of them are rather simple, monorepeats, for example, but there's some uh, more complex patterns that, as well. And we could find some links between certain patterns and mutational signatures. Um, so, so far, it's been rather, oh, no, my PowerPoint crashed. Uh, hang on for a moment. Uh, At least it was just between <laughs> between projects. Uh, let me see. Uh, 
All right, can you see it? Yes. Yes, okay, sorry for that. Um, so up until now, we've talked about mutation of signatures and very kind of an, a niche thing. Uh, in this last study, we will not talk a lot about signatures and, and hopefully you will find this very interested, interesting, at least I did when, when working this project. So this is, uh, about a mutation or, or about a, a cast type known as small intestine neuroendocrine tumors or SINF for short. It's a type of cancer that forms in the small intestine and it's very pecu peculiar because uh, for one it's multifocal so uh, here you see two patients or, or the, the small intestine cut out from two patients, patient one and two. Uh, and what you see here is that there are multiple tumors in this rather short segment, 30 centimeters or so. In blue are primary tumors. And, and then we have metastasis also in yellow uh, and uh, green, yellowish. Um, so it has this uh, multifocal phenotype. And in patient two here, you actually see a, a lot of, a lot of primary tumors in this region. Everything that is marked with a letter are the samples we have actually sequenced. Um, and so in this study, we, we first start, uh, started with the patient one, as you saw there, but eventually we ended up uh, sequencing additional patients until we had 11 patients, actually. And uh, what is interesting in this study is that we included a lot of different tumors from the same patient because we wanted to study how they relate to each other within a single within a single patient and that was something that has, hadn't really been done before so in total we had six over 60 tumors that we performed whole, whole genome sequencing on um, and so one peculiar peculiar thing is that they're multifocal another peculiar thing is the the mutational landscape in these tumors so if we start with the mutation burden in these tumors we see that it's fairly low <laughs> it's about what you would expect in any living cell. Uh, it it's, um, accumulates at, at the same rate as, as normal mutations accumulate in, in healthy cells. Um, and we also see very few potential driver events, very few uh, cancer-related genes that are mutated. The most recurrent one is CDKN1B, but as you can see, most of the tumors actually don't have mutation in CDK and 1B. And uh, when we look at the mutational signatures to see what are the processes that have been uh, acting on, the, on these tumors, then we find mainly processes related to aging, for example. Uh, and uh, most of the variation here is, is actually due to noise. So uh, don't read in too much into that. But basically what all of these say is that these are very, uh, mutationally quiet tumors, they, they don't mutate a lot and there's not uh, many potential driver events either. Uh, what is fairly common is um, uh, copy number alterations and especially uh, loss of chromosome 18 in mostly one copy but sometimes both copies of, of chromosome 18. Uh, so this happens in more than 65% of the samples and you also see some other um, some other uh, amplifications and deletions in these cancer types. So, so this is more common than, than uh, other uh, mutation types. Um, but what is very peculiar about these cancer is how they relate to each other. If we uh, look at the different primary tumors and see, uh, do they share any mutations, which, which would mean do they share a common origin? Uh, we find that they don't share any mutations, basically. There's, on the diagonal here, you see the mutation burden for each, each uh, tumor. And in, here in the pairwise, you see the, the, the overlapping mutations. So basically all of these primary tumors are completely independent from each other. So in this small region, like 30 centimeters or so, we have multiple tumors forming completely independent of each 
also see that, that the, the metastasis that we know are metastasis, those can be traced back to, to individual tumors. So in this case, the primary tumor C has uh, metastasized to all the other primary tumor, uh, all, all the other metastases. Um, so this was, of course, very, very interesting when we found it. And that's why we decided to go, uh, go forth and sequence another patient. Oh, sorry for that. Um, so the patient two that, that you saw previously had a lot of primary tumors and the, the same patterns and uh, pattern can be observed there. Basically, there's virtually no overlapping mutation. So these are also completely independent events. Whereas the single uh, metastasis L here, that we easily can trace back to, to, its, um, um, to its primary tumor. Um, and what is also very interesting is that in some cases, different primary tumors have initiated different metastases. So in, in this case, you see uh, primary tumor, tumor A in patient six here uh, uh, have seeded uh, one metastasis and another tumor, tumor B, have seeded uh, metastasis D here. And this actually occurred more than once. We found two other patients where this happened, where we had different primary tumors that caused different metastases. Uh, and in this case, you also find uh, a primary tumor that caused two different metastases but from, from one, one primary. And this is also rather important for, for this cancer type because it means that, that it, it metastasized rather easily. And, and it's important that, that the patient get actually the, the whole area um, removed so you, so you don't accidentally leave any primary tumors that might otherwise uh, metastasize. Um, so to summarize, there's very few mutations that uh, in SINet, there's uh, the convention models with mutation uh, and mutational processes leading to new, new phenotypes doesn't really seem to apply in the same sense here, at least not for, for a single nucleotide variants. But there are quite a bit of chromosome 18 loss, which might have some, um, some driving capacity. Uh, very interestingly, the, the, uh, the tumors evolve independently from each other. They don't share a somatic ancestor. And metastases seem to form rather easily. And we can sometimes find uh, metastases arising from different primary tumors in this cancer type. Um, and to summarize everything then, um, I showed uh, the mutational signature of UV and how it varies across the genome. And we looked more into longer sequence patterns in first uh, melanoma and UV, uh, and then in other cancer types as well. And in SINet, there are very few mutations, and the mutational signatures reveal that it's mostly just uh, normal aging processes active. Uh, and they form independently and metastasize easily. Uh, and that's all I had to say, and um, thank you very much for listening. And I want to thank everyone in the lab. Uh